Hello, my name's Ken Copeland. I went to work for WKY Television January of 1960. It's really hard to believe that that's been over 50 years ago. Television was still in its infancy. All black and white. Videotape had just come in, so we had sources of programming where it was film, live, uh, videotape, and of course, network. Well, a lot of things have happened since then. The old switchers that we use were the click-clack overlap type switching. Uh, they made a flash. Um, wasn't the kind of switching you see on television today. Today it's real smooth. A lot of generated effects. It's really good. It's come a long way. Back in those days, uh, one of the things we had on a film chain, we had an iconoscope. Uh, the iconoscope, we called it the I chain. Uh, the film, you had ride gain on it on the video with uh, the gain and the pedestal and the parabola too. Well, it was pretty complicated and hard to ride gain on it. The old thing sure did put out a good picture. It was sharp, but it was a little grainy. But that was the nature of television in those days. We didn't think anything about it. Uh, Later on, we had the Viticom cameras, and they worked a lot better. And two, we had the color cameras. Uh, the old color cameras, uh, we'd fire them up early in the morning, around five o'clock. And they had, to, in order to do a noonday show, we had to fire them that early because it would take a long time for those things to stabilize. And then, of course, there would be the time when the engineers would have to sit down and balance them, uh, weighing one camera against the other so that the pictures on both were the same. I would have to say that Aaron Britton, he had the magic eye. He could see colors like no one else could see. Britt, as we called him, Britt had that magical touch. He could tweak a camera, get the very best out of it, match the cameras to where they were almost totally identical. That was a real skill. And of course, uh, I remember the one time uh, when Lester Tucker was balancing the cameras and he would set up uh, a bowl of fruit down on the stage, point both cameras at the bowl, and there would be a red apple, a yellow banana, uh, maybe a green pear or something like that in the bowl. Well, one day somebody pulled one on Tucker. Tucker set up the bowl, pointed both cameras, and went back up into the control room. Someone was ready. When Tucker got up into the control room, he looked, the pear was green, the apple was red, and the banana was blue. Well, Tucker ran back down on stage. Meanwhile, someone traded the blue banana for the yellow banana. Tucker looked at it, and here it was, down on the stage live. All colors were the way they should be with the yellow banana. Tucker goes back up to the control room. Someone shifted. They put the blue banana back in and ran Tucker back and forth, up and down the sound trap, to the stage, back and forth. This must have gone on for 15 minutes before Tucker finally caught on. But it was a wonderful time. Lots of practical jokes. It was a wonderful time, indeed. A lot of practical jokes. Uh, what a family it was. People, innovative people. You were working around some of the most creative people you've ever seen. There was a lot of talent on camera, but there was a lot of talent behind the camera from stage crew, engineering, uh, projection, videotape machine. It, the talent, we were surrounded with talent. When someone would come up with an idea, can we do something? Uh, the minds would go to work and sure enough, we would be able to create the kind of special effects that 
it was almost unheard of for that day and time. Uh, white shirts were hard to focus on. They would get a blossoming effect and get a black edge to them. Well, we didn't have that problem because we had very, very good lighting people. Our video technicians were expert. We knew where to ride the game. And whites, when transmitting in color, were really, really difficult because they would have a black hue about them. Well, Aaron Britton, back to Brit, he came up with a way to do it, to where whites would be transmitted whites. He was so good at it that someone from NBC television saw what we were doing one day. They sent a guy down here to learn how to do white shirts to make white shirts not blossom. It was pretty creative, I would have to say. A lot of talent. Well, those were wonderful times. I remember the day that Jane Lyons hired me in. One of the first things that Jane did was to take me down on stage in Studio B. The stage was empty at that time. It was dark, no lights, walking around. And Jane was pointing out different things in the studio on that very first day. One of the things he did, he walked over and he picked up a microphone. He held it up to me and he said, do you know what this is? And I said, well, yes, that's a microphone. He said, you need to know right now and always keep it in your mind, never trust a microphone. You know, he was right because sometimes people have said uh, little naughty words that went out on the air that shouldn't have been said. But it's back to that old expression, be very, very careful what you say because you can never unring a bell. Well, I learned a lot of things out there. Uh, there were lots of good times out there. I remember, now it was before I went to work for Channel 4, it was in the 50s. 1956, WKY bought Channel 13 at Tampa, Florida. That was WTVT. Bob Hayward went down there as chief engineer. Well, we had uh, a couple of mobile buses at that time, the old flexible Buick buses. And uh, we had one too many, we had two of them. So we needed to send one of them away and it went to WTVT in Tampa. Well, some of the innovative people, I think maybe Arnie Katoff was in best, <laughs> involved in this one, where we had a mannequin. And it was a female mannequin and she was placed in the back of the bus, back where all the camera cables are and hid very much well away. Uh, but if you open the back back doors of the bus and look inside, and if you look past the camera cables in a dark corner, you could see Millie. And Millie had a dagger stuck right in her chest and blood draining down from it from the art department. Well, the bus was sent to Florida. And of course, the guys at Florida, they were very interested in what they had procured from WKY. <laughs> Uh, they got to milling around, and next thing you know, in their milling around, they found Millie. Well, all of a sudden, somebody let out a screech and said, my gosh, there's a body back there. Well, they clambered around and looked, and sure enough, back in the dark shadows was Millie. Well, what did they do? They called the police. Well, here they... <laughs> Tampa Police Department shows up and the detectives. It made quite a stir and I understand that the Tampa Police Department, they were not real happy about this, but it was a great joke, wasn't it? <laughs> we, we had a great time out there. Uh, if you couldn't take a joke, that was not the place for you to be because Jokes were always being played on everyone. Good practical job. And it was all in clean fun, but yeah, sometimes our jokes got a little carried away. Uh, such as when Bob Rodkey was directing one day, 
someone hooked up a hose to where they could blow smoke. That, oh, yeah, we smoked in the control room during those times. Cigarettes, cigars, that was uh, normal. But uh, someone was blowing smoke down through a tube laid up into the switcher and uh, Bob Rodkey is switching back and forth with the switchers and the fader. All of a sudden, oh, damn, damn, the place is on fire and Rodkey panicked. <laughs> hey, that was fun. Well, everybody probably has a Billy Nick story. I think probably uh, my very best Billy Nick story. Uh, I always thought Billy Nix was the quickest wit alive. Billy was so fast on the uptake, it was unreal. He probably should have been in front of the camera instead of behind the camera. Billy was so quick. He was Johnny Carson quick, he really was. Uh, one day we were in Studio C, we were going to do a recording, and Bob Jenny was gonna come out and do something. Bob Jenny was curator of reptiles at the Oklahoma City Zoo. Well, we kept waiting around for Bob Jenny to show up, uh, we were ready for our taping session, and Bonnie, Bob Jenny wasn't showing, wasn't showing. Finally, Nix gets on the phone, he calls around a little bit, and he found out that uh, Bob wasn't going to be there. Uh, Bob was a little sick that day, and it was an impromptu kind of a thing, kind of a quick sick that he got. Uh, but. Uh, Billy says, uh, he's on the phone and he says, uh-huh, yeah, uh-huh, uh-huh, yeah, yeah. And then he hangs up the phone. He turns around, looks at the rest of the crew and he said, uh, Bob Jenny won't be here today because something he disagreed with ate him. Well, uh, we all roared hilariously at this because uh, some of the creatures he would bring out were the kind of creatures that could eat you rather than you, you <laughs> than you getting eat up. Oh, it was terrible. But <laughs> anyway, the control room was in a hilarious mood and we roared about that one. Good times, good funny times. You know, when you work for WKY Radio and Television, you work for both, radio and television. I worked in the engineering department and there were a lot of different things that happened. I remember one morning on a Sunday morning when uh, upstairs in radio, they were having a little technical problems up in radio. Well, they called down and uh, so I was downstairs and I answered the phone and uh, we got somebody who can come up here and help us, our radio console is giving us the trouble. So I broke loose and I went upstairs and that was my first encounter with a gentleman named Chibi Graham. Chibi Graham would come out on Sunday mornings and uh, Don Wallace was a DJ that morning on uh, Sunday morning radio. And uh, Chibi, he was president of the Oklahoma Milk Producers Association. They had a radio show every Sunday morning. Well, I went upstairs and I got acquainted uh, with Chibi Graham. And you know, it was really interesting because later on, uh, I started learning to fly and I got my pilot certificate and I got acquainted with Chibi Graham and I'm surely glad that I did because Chibi had been a World War I fighter pilot. And then another pilot I got to talk with one time, Arthur Godfrey. Uh, that was an experience. We were doing a taping session and Godfrey was down on stage and we were doing this tape session. I made mention, I said, geez, I sure would like to talk to Godfrey, shake his hand. Well, Godfrey's PR man was sitting there in the control room and he looked at me and he said, oh, oh, don't, don't, don't go around Godfrey. Uh, he's in kind of a bad mood and Godfrey, he'll just, he'll just eat you up. And I thought, well, geez, what kind of a guy is this? Anyway, uh, after the tape session, I walked out into the hallway to get a drink of water from the water fountain. And around the uh, corner uh, came Godfrey and uh, Danny Williams. And uh, they walked up and I'm facing Godfrey face to face. And I'm, I'm looking straight at Godfrey and I, I just couldn't help myself. Mr. Godfrey, he looked at me and he said, what the hell do you want? And I said, well, sir, you and I, we have something in common. He said, what the hell is that? I said, well, sir, uh, we both hold airline transport ratings. 
And all of a sudden, the ice broke. Godfrey stuck out his hand and smiled and he says, well, put her there, partner. And he shook my hand and Godfrey and I sat and talked or stood and talked for 30 minutes right there in the hallway. And behind Godfrey was his PR man shaking in his head in disbelief. He couldn't believe, but boy, the aviation thing broke Godfrey wide open. I'd like to talk just a little bit about the color cameras that we had. Uh, I well remember those cameras and the serial numbers. Serial numbers were uh, number seven, number 11, and number 34. Don't ask me how I remember those serial numbers, but they're well embossed in my mind. Those were the cameras that CBS Network wanted. They wanted them badly. Buddy Sugg was manager of uh, television at that day and time and he would not turn loose of those color cameras. So uh, therefore, WKY Television became the first television station in the world to have color other than NBC Network. But uh, those big cameras, oh, they took a long time to set up. And uh, uh, they were hard to work with. They were heavy. They were huge. That always took two people to push them around. Well, there were many, many times Channel 4 gave me a good insight to life, gave me good ideas of what to do, what not to do. I learned so much. A lot of good, wonderful friends. Channel 4, WKY, hey, it was like a family. Enjoyed it so very much. But I chose to go another direction. I went into aviation. And today, uh, I'm still flying, but I'm not doing the kind of flying I used to do. No longer am I doing corporate flying or flying the jets. Flying the smaller airplanes, doing pilot certifications. And by the way, uh, pilot certifications, I have certificated over 4,000 pilots. And it's been a wonderful time, a lot of fun. I have an office at Wiley Post Airport at Atlantic Aviation. And if you want to drop by, I'll buy the coffee. Thanks a lot. See ya.